Teenagers spend 16 hours locked in a college gym discussing important issues ranging from AIDS to homelessness for the first annual Celebrate Life Lock-In. Then we'll visit St. Patrick's Church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where they're making efforts to accommodate the growing Hispanic population. Next on Catholic Magazine. With your window on your world, this is Catholic Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Paul Perillo. And I'm Pat Shelton. And we're both very glad you decided to start the new year off with us and Catholic Magazine. On tonight's program, we'll meet Joseph Barbera, the well-known creator of such animated cartoon classics as The Flintstones, Yabba Dabba Doo, and Yogi Bear. Well, tonight we'll find out how Mr. Barbera is taking some of the stories of the Bible now and bringing them to life for children. We'll also hear the emotional story of Charles Lawanga, a 19th century African saint from Uganda who gave his life defending children. But first, we travel to St. Patrick's Church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a church struggling now in an urban setting to meet the needs of its changing population, now Hispanic. St. Patrick's Church has been sitting here since the year 1875. Located in a working-class neighborhood on the south side of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, St. Patrick's has faced drastic changes. This once grand and majestic structure has slowly deteriorated over its century-long history. Its stained glass windows, known around the world for their beauty and value, are in serious disrepair. St. Patrick's has also seen its share of hard economic times and a dramatic shift in population. A hundred years ago, the immigrants who settled here were Irish. This neighborhood was a haven for the Irish. That is, until city leaders decided to construct a new freeway through the middle of the parish. It was then, with the area literally split in half, that the residents began to leave slowly at first, but it was the beginning of something new here. A neighborhood was changing, and the Catholic Church and the Jesuit priests who ran it here had to change too. This mostly white, English-speaking community slowly evolved into a community of new immigrants, Hispanic-speaking Catholics looking to build their own identity and their own opportunities. Father Rick Abert is the pastor at St. Patrick's. He is keenly aware of the cultural differences in the parish. His job as pastoral leader of the parish centers largely on his ability to unify the parish and bridge the ever-present culture gaps. Our parish right now would be predominantly a Puerto Rican community. The English-speaking community, it's a lot smaller and so it's the minority community. I need to make sure that, that in our programming or in our, even our services, our liturgies, that we really need to be responsive to that group of people and, and really need to let them know that they are part of the community. What happens, I think, is that we we can tend toward uh, favoring a majority community. And I think I probably fall prey to that because I'm very new to the Hispanic culture, both in language and, and in the culture itself. But balancing different cultures and attending to their specific needs is a precarious task. Many Hispanics who were reared in the Catholic Church are immigrating to the United States and changing churches. The Catholic Church in many instances has been unable to bend and flex with this wave of new immigrants. Strangers in a new land, many Hispanics have felt like strangers in the church too. When I came from Puerto Rico, it was a, 
when it's already some uh, Spanish, uh, Puerto Rican people, uh, start a uh, Spanish mass. And it was kind of a uh, mess, you know, like uh, there was a lot of problems between the Hispanic and the, and the English-speaking people and in the parish. We didn't feel accepted for, from the American people because probably we didn't understand each other, the language. We didn't speak English at all. And we didn't understand the mass. So there were many problems facing St. Patrick's Parish. The biggest problem, however, was bridging the culture gap between the English-speaking residents and their new Spanish-speaking neighbors. St. Patrick's became the focal point. How do you uh, uh, allow the liturgy of the word or the word of God to be proclaimed in a way that, that it's accessible to both communities, at least to a great you know, uh, proportion, without uh, having to repeat uh, readings or repeat um, sermons uh, too much or repeat parts of the Mass. I think the integration has been, has been pretty good. We've had to learn how to do liturgies well um, together, and that's not always easy. Uh, we try to uh, do both the English and the Spanish without putting one or the other community or both communities as asleep, and, and so there's a trick to that. The parish has responded. The cultural gap here is growing smaller. I'm always gratified by the way people come to the aid of each other, you know, when they know that there's a problem. They really do take care of each other. That, that's really important. Um, and that's, that's taught me a lot and, and teaches me a lot. Here at St. Patrick's, serving and working with the different cultures has been a challenge. But the cultural differences are now beginning to be understood as positive opportunities to enhance and nurture the entire church community. There are now programs here for the homeless and the unemployed. A shelter has been set up to help those with no place to live. A food pantry has been established, and the parish sponsors a lunch program for senior citizens. We just want to keep uh, helping other people who come and helping for the future, our kids and the youth. The church is not for one group, it's for everybody. I'm really proud, uh, very proud of this. Uh, community and this parish here and I think the future is I think it's going to be great with the world changing so quickly we must commend St. Patrick's for adapting so well to the needs of the people we'll be right back a holiday message from the Archdiocese of Philadelphia and Cardinal Bevilacqua. The holidays are a time when we focus our attention on the needs of others and our thoughts turn to the concerns of peace, hope, and goodwill. Throughout the upcoming weeks, the Archdiocese of Philadelphia will be showing you what people just like you are doing to make Christmas last all year long. You will meet people who feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, and reach out to neighbors in need. These people feel the deep joy and personal satisfaction that comes from helping others. You can too. Many people would like to help but don't know how. That is why the Archdiocese of Philadelphia has developed a volunteer hotline. Find out how you can help by dialing 587-0595. Together, we can make Christmas last all year long. With so many negative stories about teenagers in the media today, our next segment focuses on some positive things the teens are doing. A group of teens spent 16 hours locked in a college gymnasium attempting to improve themselves spiritually in Celebrate Life Lock-In. Enjoying life free of drugs and alcohol was just one of many messages that some 300 teenagers listened to at the Diocese of Scranton's first Celebrate Life lock-in. Sponsored by the Diocese Pro-Life and Youth Ministry Offices, the event literally locked in these young people at King's College Gym in Wilkesbury. Under the supervision of volunteer chaperones, young Christians from around the diocese spent the night together sharing their faith and their concerns. 
The 16-hour program started off with a prayer service, followed by Pride of Wyoming Valley, a group of area teenagers who show others how great life can be without drugs or alcohol. Last year, our diocese went through a process with young people asking them what are their concerns about their future life. And we had the survey develop three issues. And the issues, the first one was sexuality, the second one was substance abuse, and the third one was the fact that young people didn't feel that there was a place in the, in the church for them. And so the church decided to take a stand and, and address the, the issues that the young people brought forth last year. And that's how this whole program developed, is out of their request. We don't assume that they're learning in their classroom or in their homes. We know they're not. Well, we go out and talk to them, and they, they're not hearing the truth. A lot of them are relying on the information they get from TV, magazines, newspapers, and we know that a lot of that's out now lies, and sometimes it's well-meaning people who are putting out the wrong message. That proves how much you love somebody. That's chastity. One of the highlights of the lock-in was a talk by Mary Beth Bonacci, a nationally renowned lecturer who talks to thousands of teenagers each year about the challenge of chastity. Chastity, I honestly believe, respecting our sexuality, respecting the land of sexuality, is the only way to find love again. The only way to find love in a loveless world. So what does chastity mean? Does it mean you draw a line down the center of the room, I stay on this side, you stay on that side? No, chastity means respecting the language of the body. The lock-in was also a chance for these teenagers to meet other youth from around the diocese who share common values and to enjoy each other's company. You have to have a good uh, blend, a good blend for them. Prayer is an important component and the speakers are certainly an important component, but we want them to have fun. We want them to come together and really celebrate. That's what this is all about. There are kids here from all over the diocese. A lot of them don't know each other. We hope by the end of the night they've had a chance to dance together, eat together, and just have a good time. <laughs> The lock-in provided a nice blend of music, comedy, and theater, but underlying it all was a challenge to these young Christians to live out their faith. Yeah, I think that's a, like exemplified here tonight, like everybody's showing up here, and I think they're all going to take it back to their own parishes, to their own schools, and try to take these point of views and try to teach them to other kids, other kids that need to be taught. I think it's very important because a lot of the sitcoms and just the things you hear about every day is constantly, and even the articles you read in the magazine, well, it's okay, you know, to do these things, and everything is, you know, it's okay, but it's really not, and I think we need to have people saying, you know, it's not right to do that, but there are reasons, they should tell you what you should be doing, and I think it's very good to be, come to something like this, it's casual, it's relaxed, you can have a good time, but at the same time, you're learning something about God, and it's all together. Or one singular sensation. Campus ministry students from College Misericordia were another highlight of this year's lock-in. Through the art of mime, they encouraged these young Christians to make the most of the time God has given us. Some of the things that happen in our lives, we have control over. Others, we know that we didn't start the fire. Yet no matter what has happened, All the hours of the day are ours, created by God and given to us to make the most out of them. Now is the time to make our own fire with all the time God has given us. May we make the most out of what God has created.
The locket also featured the talents of Mary Oswald. Born a congenital amputee, Mary works in New Jersey as a vocational counselor, but in her free time travels around the country talking to groups about the sanctity of life. When I think about the fact that I'm here, After 16 hours, most were tired and looking forward to a good night's sleep. But organizers of the lock-in hope these teenagers returned home with an even deeper faith and the desire to share that faith with others. I hope they leave here feeling proud to be proud of their faith, proud of themselves for having made the good choice to come here, and just enthusiastic to go out and share the messages they got here with their peers. Next, we'll meet Joseph Barbera from Hanna Barbera Productions, whose new series, The Greatest Adventure, brings stories of the Bible to us through animation. Hey, Boo Boo, wake up! What is it, Yogi? Joe Barbera called me into his office one day and said, uh, Do you have any interest in the Bible? Do you, do you know? much about it. And I said, well, I have an interest in it, and I know a little bit about it. I've read it and had some experience studying it, but I, I don't pretend to be an expert. And he said, well, for 17 or 18 years, he's been wanting to do a, uh, a series uh, of animated Bible programs. And I immediately thought it was just a sensational idea. So for 17 years, every year, I would look at the Bible stories and say, these stories are fabulous. I think that he's a, he's a man who has a gift for seeing the world in a, in a way that is um, unique. He, he tells the story, probably did to you already, of as a, as a boy um, in, a, in Holy Innocence uh, Elementary School doing a mural of, the, of Jesus entering Jerusalem. I remember working on this. It was like a giant mural for me, you know. I'm down about here, and this thing is up there. Chalk dust is filtering down all over you. If anyone had patted me on the back, you'd get a cloud of chalk dust, you know? Obviously, he had a, you know, a strong um, background in, in biblical teachings growing up in a Catholic family. And I think that that made him really believe in those stories as a, as a child. So in approaching the stories, I knew one big handicap was going to be if we said, we're doing the Bible series. And as, I, as I'm, I'm going to have to repeat myself, the minute you say the Bible series to kids, to Sunday school, to families, you're going to say, okay, hey, that's nice. Let's stick it on the shelf here. But if when I say the greatest adventure, I'm giving it another flavor. So to do this, what I wanted to do was kind of get a viewpoint of contemporary kids, okay? So I got two young archaeologists on a dig, you know, in Egypt, and they have met and uh, become friendly with a young nomad who has a Dodger baseball cap on and a T-shirt and sandals, and he's kind of a little smart, ale smart alecky, but he's a good kid. And they get caught in one of these sand whirlpools, which uh, I remember seeing in Lawrence of Arabia. And when the dust settles, they stare up in awe at a vast chamber filled with giant relics and artifacts from another civilization. And there, at the far end of the cavern, a door with a strange inscription. All who enter these portals pass through time. And we wanted those three kids, Derek and Margot and Moki, to be the eyes and the ears and senses of our children who watch the programs. And it was just really a, a way to get our children more involved. The project required more than a full year of study before production could begin. Producer Kay Wright and his staff devoted countless hours to researching the music, art, architecture, and clothing styles of Bible times. 
Artists spent months creating finely detailed background scenes. Others carefully refined character models, striving for realism and authenticity. Stature and facial features were designed to match the voices chosen for the animated characters. has commanded me to bring you out of Egypt and to lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey. So, you... All right, go. Oh. What is Moses doing? You're entertaining and you're holding the, the kids and you're holding the family because we want the family. And then underneath it comes the message, which is the best way to, to, to bring messages of moral value. And that's what's in every one of these, these tapes. From animation now to an illustrated story of St. Charles Luanga, who stood up against the immoral practices of the King of Uganda. And standing up against the King of Uganda cost him his life. Throughout the late 1800s, the African country of Uganda was struggling with political change. In 1884, a young king came into power, King Nwanga. He continuously imposed a highly immoral lifestyle on the young pages who served him. The king taught the boys that sexual molestation was a natural and common practice. But soon, a young African was put in charge of the pages. His name was Charles Luanga. Charles Luanga, a recent convert to Catholic faith, began instructing his pages in the teachings of Christ. He encouraged and supported their efforts to remain pure and defy the king's immoral practices. The king resented the change, but the young men refused to give up their faith. The king ordered that Charles Luanga and his young followers be put to death. The executioners marched them to a village 37 miles away. On the way, they were starved, beaten, and chained. Once they reached the village, they collected wood for seven days. On June 3, 1886, Luanga and the boys were stripped of their clothing, and each one was wrapped in a reed mat and laid on the fire. Above the ritual chants of the executioners, the young martyrs of Uganda died, calling out the name of Jesus and singing Christian hymns. In 1964, Luanga and these martyrs were named saints of the Roman Catholic Church by Pope Paul VI. From St. Charles and his companions, in whose honor we dedicate this statue and shrine. May we follow you in the footsteps of the Lord. The community of St. Paul's Catholic Church recently dedicated a shrine to St. Charles Luanga. Father Fred Roos, pastor of St. Paul's, says the shrine symbolizes the significant presence and commitment of African-American Catholics in the parish, but also holds out a vision of faithfulness for the church as a whole, especially for young people so that we have in Charles Luanga and his companions their youthfulness. And that appeals to all our young people. This parish is dedicated to, a, to education, and uh, we have a lot of young people. So St. Charles really kind of affirms that young people can make a contribution to the church, no matter what their color, no matter their background, their education, that they can make a commitment. Member Shirley Lee. The shrine represents um, an ideal of faith that uh, people of all races and creeds at that time 
and still do, uh, respect Catholicism as a re religion and are willing to die for it. Member Mildred Broxton shares the feelings of many members. I cried, as a matter of fact. Something about it that was just different, it appealed to my spirit. I, I felt very good. I still feel very good about it. He's my shame. St. Charles Luanga and the Martyrs of Uganda, one of my favorite stories. And Paul, the story, it, it really is good for young people because it's about young people who gave up their lives rather than deny their faith. Mm -hmm. I heartily recommend it for young people, but buy a children's version because there are some very gory details. And maybe uh, Mr. Barbera will bring the, uh, the story of St. Charles Luanga to uh, the animation process and make a cartoon classic out of it. That would be great, that would be great. And so we want to wish everybody a very healthy, happy, and holiest of New Year's. From me, Pat Shelton. And from me, Paul Pirello. We'll see you next time. Good, Good night, night, everybody. You want to go dancing and kick off the New Year? Why not? All right. <laughs> Set materials for Catholic Magazine provided by Tag Lover Incorporated, serving the Delaware Valley for over 75 years. And by John Wanamaker, fine stores in the Delaware Valley. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and donations, and encourage you to write us at Catholic Magazine, St. Charles Seminary, 1000 East Wynwood Road, Overbrook, Pennsylvania, 19096, or call us during regular business hours at 668-9842. holiday message from the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. With the help of volunteers, the Archdiocese of Philadelphia is imparting hope at Mercy Hospice. Here, 50 women and their children receive the help needed to tackle the challenges of independent living. Chanel Hawkins is just one of the many women who have found hope at Mercy Hospice. Learn how you can help. Call the volunteer hotline at 587-0595. Together, we can make Christmas last all year long.